Hi everyone, welcome to Saris on Screen. I'm Usha. And I'm Rico. And we're talking about politics, patriarchy, and pop culture. Catch us every other Friday as we do feminist deep dives into South Asian culture and cinema. This week, we're starting a new segment called the Saucy Deep Dives. In these deep dives, we pick classic, iconic South Asian movies, not just from Bollywood, but all over South Asia. We're going to analyze and discuss them through an intersectional feminist lens using our very own sauce meter. For this episode, we chose Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Gum, lovingly called K3G, a movie we've all probably watched a million times and one that has influenced many of our childhoods and teenage years. I think as a self-professed Shah Khan <laughs> fan growing up in South Asia, like this was one of the movies that I've probably watched like more than I ever should have. <laughs> like I've watched it way too many times. I think like a lot of people are guilty of that too. Yeah, I think it's been imprinted on a lot of people's like brains for like the past 20 years yeah like the songs are like such bops and it's just like it is so iconic in so many ways like whether it's like how it influenced like south asian fashion south asian like you know like just general culture like y2k culture oh, yeah. in south asia it's like i think this movie has played such a big role in like doing all that and while we I mean, we hope that you've watched it. If not, like, you should go watch it on Netflix. I think it's on there right now. But, like, for those of you who haven't watched, we're going to do, like, a quick synopsis. So, essentially, it's, like, this super rich family. Like, I think their house is was, like, shot in London. So, like, it wasn't even shot in, like, um, India. So, you know they're rich because, like, the house is, like, a mansion. It's a palace. Like, not even a and- mansion. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know where in Delhi like that was supposed to where be. Would it like, fit? Just... Yeah, so you have this Raichan family with Amitabh Bachchan being like the head of the family. And then you have his adopted son. Like in the very beginning, you're shown that Shah Rukh Khan is like an adopted son. And he also, I think they have another kid later. And so they live in this like ginormous ass palace for some reason. And like Amitabh Bachchan is super proud of Shah Rukh Khan because he went to like Oxford to do an MBA or something. And Shah Rukh Khan has like a huge case of like daddy worship. Like he's just like completely <laughs> in awe of his like dad and just wants to be him essentially. Yeah, no, it's very weird, but, like, I mean, it, it's kind of the vibe, like, you know, it's, like, a very monarchy vibe, like, oh, this is the king, and you're the you're the heir, like, prince person, which, so, like, Shah Khan has a lot of complexes about it, and he has all these expectations that he's gonna be, like, his dad, and then he's also gonna marry, like, some rich guy's daughter, and, and like, this is where you see Rani Mukherjee come in, and, like, she, I mean, that's the only reason why she's there, and it all starts with, like, this, like, big puja thing, where, like, Jaya Bachchan, like, just like ESPs and find out the Shah Khan's <laughs> attending and you're just there to show like how tight they are like so Jaya Bachchan is like really really like Shah Khan and completely neglects her other child <laughs> like and and fat shames him like constant like I don't think she fat shames him I she's like everybody okay else with fat, shames fat him. shaming him though yeah I think the only person who stands up to yeah, it is like seriously. Daijan right like Daijan is the only person who like stands up to it it starts like with like this like flashbacky thing and whatnot but wait no wait no it wait, starts no, it doesn't with start the like that it starts match. with Rithik yeah, Roshan it starts with the cricket match <laughs> oh my God. and then and then Rithik Roshan finds out through the flashback yeah Oh my god, yeah, okay, so we find out as Rithik Roshan finds out, like, what the f*** happened in this family, and it it also, like, do you remember, like, how weird the beginning scene is? It's like, he's having, like, this flashback of his brother worshipping his dad, like, and it's like a sunscary inception, because he's like, oh, like, it's his brother talking about how his dad used to say something, and it's like, okay, like, also, like, Nobody bothered to tell Ruthie Groshan for like a decade that his brother was like banished from the family. Like, what was that? <laughs> yeah, like, just, nobody told him anything. Yeah, and he just kind of like, just like assumed that his brother just up and left for some reason. Which is like, you'd think you'd question yeah, that you'd at some point. Yeah, you'd ask someone or someone um, would bother telling you. 
Oh my god. Yeah. So yeah, like while this is a horrible synopsis already, obviously, but generally, so Rithik Roshan is like super confused. He like graduates from like boarding school, I think, and he's like super hot, and he like goes back and he sees his daddy and nani just very openly talking about like how Shah Khan was banished, and then they act like super surprised that like oh my god, how did you hear about it? And it's like oh, you were literally in the middle of a. F- castle talking about this like um it was very like bad but like the, the setup is bad but then Rithik Roshan sits down and the daddies and the nannies start like talking about like this like whole like situation and so we like flash back into like Shah Rukh Khan's era where like Shah Rukh Khan is hot and Rithik Roshan <laughs> is a fat kid it starts with like showing us like sort of how elegant and blah 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 like how like sanskari and like shit like the raichans are and then you kind of contrast into like um Kajol's like side of the story where she's in like Chandni Chowk, right? Yeah, two sides of Delhi, the Raichan Palace and Chandni Chowk. <laughs> and I mean, I've grown up in Delhi and I mean, neither Chandni Chowk nor the Raichan Palace like exist the way they do in the movie, clearly. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fantastical Delhi where there's enough space for like a Hogwarts mansion and then Chadley yeah, Chadley like right walking next to distance. it, but not visible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, and like I grew up in Dhaka and like everything is walking distance <laughs> and nothing is walkable. So like this movie always like completely like baffled me. Um, so yeah, so Shah Khan is essentially doing his shit when he like ends up going to Chadni Jok to like I think give Daijan like medicine or something, and I think that's when he runs into Kajol and Kajol I think Kajol dad runs a sweet shop in like um, Chadni Jok. And so, like, he runs into her. He's, like, immediately smitten. She just seems, like, she's confused. There's, like, this whole, like, scene and everything. And so general synopsis and not, like, every detail recounted. Essentially, he falls in love with her. She kind of isn't into it at the beginning. And then her dad dies. He, like, is, like, okay, we have to get married. Um, And then at the funeral, he's, like, we have to get married. So, like, I feel like I should mention that. And then he, like, takes her and to like the Rajan palace and like Amitabh Bachchan is like oh no this is like super whack like you cannot bring this bitch in like it is it just does not work we need like you know Rani Mukherjee who we're all hot for <laughs> um and then Shah Rukh Khan gets banished that's the general summary and it's like super classes that's like the whole that's the whole plot point that is like super f- classes and then Rithik Roshan like comes back like a decade later and he's like I have to reunite my family and like I'm going to bring Bhaiya back and Bobby back and everything. And, like, he sneaks off to London. And, like, essentially they do all end up together. But they never actually resolve the problem. Like, Mamita Bachchan's classism and everything. It's like a happily ever after over a problem that they never address. Yeah, it's like burying your head in the sand and being like, everything is okay, everything is okay. Like, we're fine, we're all together, and we'll just completely ignore we're the rich. fact. Yeah, we're rich, we'll, we'll get over this. Um, and like, oh yeah, and there is also Karina Kapoor, who like also exists. Um, I don't think, beyond being like completely iconic and everything, I don't know what else like her like specific role in the movie is. And like, like transitioning from like, you know, just stand next to her yeah with yeah pretty much and yeah. sad like and yeah like the, well transition down from like western slutty to like sanskari which is like you know the which is always the growth you want to see in bollywood movies right like it's like when like you've turned someone back to sanskari yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Fixed her. yeah so that's the really bad synopsis that we clearly did it super horribly but like i feel like most people should would already know about it so like it's fine um so yeah like that's the general gist of the movie and i feel like it's really weird like because like when we were planning to watch this movie for this episode we thought like we'll just like gloss over it because like i'm pretty sure this movie is just like i have it memorized like shot by shot and (laughs) and then i like when we started watching it and we ended up watching all three and a half hours and i mean this movie isn't for, like, your, you know, 
attention wandering like viewer like you need to commit <laughs> your like three to four hours of your life yeah. to it um yeah no and it's just like funny because like we were just so we were so staunch that we would not watch it and then we just kind of failed because it's such a good movie like i feel like we'll be talking like a lot about like how we watched it now but it's such a good movie and i think it was a good movie when i first watched it as a kid and it's a good movie even now like it's a it's a really fun movie it's entertaining and i think like criticisms of it doesn't take away from its like entertainment value absolutely not like i think i enjoyed it as a child and i enjoyed it as an adult like even though my politics have changed or like the lenses with which i would like critique a movie yeah. have changed i still like had a lot of fun watching it like and there's nothing wrong with like enjoying mm-hmm. it and like know? i think like one of the things that i was thinking about when i was watching it is like as a bangladeshi kid like i grew up watching like bollywood like it was just like i mean i think most kids in south asia did end up watching bollywood because that is like the big like central right. like media production for like south asia and i think it felt like a really big deal at that point to see like all these like muslims on tv at that time i was like oh wow like look like they're doing like muslimy things like you know and it's like that's nice like and it felt like i mean it wasn't like like in a representative way like i i mean as i grow up i realized that it was like kind of shitty representation but like back then it felt like nice because i was like oh look like there's like islamic like aesthetic and whatnot and like at the at the very bare minimum i think at that age like when i watched it i was like nine or ten or something like i don't know i think we mm. might have been younger this came out in 2003 one, one. okay so we were like one. six so, so yeah my ability to re- <laughs> register or like properly critique like tokenism was very bad at that age um <laughs> very limited, limited. Yeah. like as sad as it is to say but at six it was very limited um, but yeah, no, I think about how like even watching Pooja, like I mean, as I was talking about, like Karina Kapoor's character was so iconic, and I think seeing someone be so like unabashedly like feminine, like was also like really like mm-hmm. empowering in like the weirdest way. Like you know, like it was just like oh look, she's dressing how she wants and she's DGAFing like when like kajol or like you know i don't think kajol said anything to her but like when Shahrukh khan says anything she just like absolutely doesn't give a fuck which is like just something that you don't see as a south asian child and even and even her like pursuing gritik russian it's so unapologetic right she's very open about the fact that she likes him and like wants it to go somewhere and that isn't something you necessarily like women making the first move or taking initiative isn't really something that Bollywood showed then and it's slowly becoming something that you know is shown now but I think it was really iconic when it did happen and it was a positive thing that came out of the movie for sure yeah no and like I think that like I mean, it's rare even now to see, like, women being the initiator, like, women initiating, like, relationships or, like, even, like, romantic, like, pursuing someone Mm -hmm. romantically of their own accord and not being pursued first. And, like, now that I think back to it, like, it, it was a really big deal. Like, I think in a lot of ways, when I was growing up, like, a lot of these, like, elements, or, like, even Kajol being, like, super, like, like, just, like, loud and like having opinions like even in places where like you know that are stifled by sort of patriarchy and classes sort of structures Kajol's ability to still like speak out I mean primary because she wasn't like very like like cognizant of it but like also like it I mean it felt like very like it felt like a big deal when you're watching it because you're like oh look like these are women who are talking and i think the movie also did a really good job in like contrasting like jaya bachan like being like so completely silent to like and like daijan being mm-hmm. like very like passive and trying to like you know quiet down like you know like ruckus and like whatnot into like also like con- contrasting that with to like kajol and karina's characters the movie makes a good job of presenting them as very vocal people and i think like women getting voices was just v- not very common in movies from that era like and also now yeah definitely definitely yeah and i think like what you mentioned about you know um representation of like different identities like sure we do see 
you know muslim people in the movie and a muslim family and they're like fairly prominent like supporting characters but i always feel like when i watch the movie now it's such a it's such an appropriation of a certain aesthetic mm -hmm. for the sake of like the setting of a hindu romance or like an upper yeah, class and i think like there's something like added to there's like another added classist element to it because like all the rich people are culturally very deeply sanskari and hindu and like all they all jaya Bachchan seems to do is like do like puja like, yeah, like, like i don't think i've seen her do anything <laughs> other than do puja and cry and be like stifled by amita Bachchan. but like i feel like the contrast of like chadni chalk as a setting which is like i think i mean it's there to contrast it against like the Raichan palace where chadni chalk is a more economically disadvantaged place and so of course there's diversity and minorities like there which like again isn't like wrong but like, I'm not saying that like, oh, you should have shown like a rich Muslim at the weird Shava Shava party or something. But I'm just saying that like, like not to like check boxes, but like it feels weird that is diversity is used to like glorify poverty in like a weird way. Like, oh, look, these people, they may not have much, but they have color and they have happiness. They have harmony. Look at yeah. them like celebrating each other's festivals yeah. and like yeah and i think like while i enjoyed it like i think on the surface level why that while that's very like nice to see like all the harmonizing and like everything like i think when you try to look at it deeper it just feels like it takes away a lot of substance from like this sort of mm -hmm. like coexisting and everything because like yeah it feels superficial right it doesn't feel real and this isn't to say that like oh like um you need to show like a historical like um, background into like hindu muslim conflict in like you know poorer parts of delhi or anything but it feels like like i mean it does feel really like shitty when like the characters are only there to add like an aesthetic flavor to the entire movie and if that's the only reason that you have minorities in a movie or like even like economically disadvantaged people in like a movie then it's not really commentating on anything it's just it's just, you know, glorifying it in, like, a really weird way. It's, like, the same way that people will, like, go on, like, those, like, mission trips and, like, take picture of pictures of, like, poor children and everything. And then it'll be, like, it'll be a part of their, like, aesthetic backdrop, right? And I think it's very weird when, like, you have, like, these, like, Muslim characters like Ruksar and, like, Daijan, who, like, is a very prominent char side character in the movie. But, like, her religion doesn't inform her much beyond like just like her daughter's wedding yeah and even like her daughter's wedding is essentially a setting for Shah Rukh Khan and Kajol to romance each other and sing that song and yeah that, right? yeah like, and like I think like that's the thing that we're not really looking for like we're not asking for a lot when we're saying that like yeah you don't have to do a history lesson but you can at least have muslim characters who at least are informed by their identities beyond just serving as like a, like an aesthetic backdrop to like the main characters like and or like adding to their diversity instead of like being like just a whole person like because rooks are like i think like I mean, all I remember from her, like, she wore a lot of pastels. She liked cricket. And she was Daijan's daughter, who Daijan just, like, completely abandons. Like, and that's it. Like, that is... <laughs> to dig after, to look after Rahul and <laughs> yeah. family instead. And yeah. And it's just, like, yeah, no, like, it's, like, where, like, if you have minority characters and then you just essentially make them just, like, plot devices, like, who only serve to like you know help the main characters and then do and have nothing and have their like sort of like identities not affect them remotely then it's just tokenism at that point right yeah and when even when we look at like the whole Chandni Chok social dynamic in general either the minority characters are you know an aesthetic 
or they're like there for comic relief. Like if you remember that scene where Ritik Roshan comes back and goes to Chandni Chowk and meets like Johnny Lever and his family, they're purely there for like the comedy in the scene, you know, even though they're like tiny, they have tiny roles, but they're only there for the comedy. Even Kajol for that matter. I think like it's also problematic with Johnny Lever's character because like there's that like colorism element that's always existed with his characters, right? All and not just this movie like all movies like a part right. of the reason why you're supposed to laugh at him is because he's darker skinned and I think this is something that all of us kind of want to like ignore when we watch because he's in so many of our childhood favorites like uh, so many of them oh yeah and he's always and he's funny. never a main character he's never a main character and he's always like he's funny and he's pathetic like you know the whole joke is that oh look he's so dumb or he's doing stupid things that's because and like and a part of the funny is supposed to be that he's a dark skin which is like really problematic in like retrospect right that that is what he was set up as and that's what we've been okay with like for now and i'm pretty sure there's like characters like that in like modern movies too and this has just been a persistent problem in bollywood and like other south asian media and even in his like comedy like he's never he you're never laughing with him you're always like laughing at him somehow like he's the butt end of the joke right he's not the one making you laugh per se like in that sense and like the colorism aspect has so many like you know castist like connotations to it as well like that Mm -hmm. being you know a part of why it's problematic as well yeah and like yeah and i think that's not even just like the end of like how this movie was problematic like in terms of like even just like the tokenism and just the blatant just like mistreatment of like these sort of minority characters but like also like looking at like economically like disadvantaged characters so where like kajol and like karina kapoor's character and like their dad are supposed to come in which like i don't like it's i mean they seem like they're like i can like comparatively economically disadvantaged but like seem to be doing okay yeah she's supposed to be middle class i mean the writings are like the one yeah. percent like they're literally 0.01 percent <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty much yeah like they're traveling around in like helicopters and shit uh, <laughs> yeah and like yeah and meanwhile you have like kajol's family which is like more of like a um like like you know like a middle class family with like a store and everything and i think that they also kind of like do a bad like i don't i don't know like i did not feel very comfortable with the portrayal of like kajol or the examination of class in terms of like kajol's character or anything and like i'm not looking for like a marxist analysis again like but i'm just saying that it's just like oh she's poor so she's grass and like you know she's like stingy and it's like supposed to be funny you know like that's the that's the whole takeaway that like oh like look she doesn't know how to do like basic shit because she's like you know poor and she doesn't have like like she's not aware of like class hierarchy and like it's never critical like you know like it doesn't feel critical of the fact that like oh that kajol is seen differently by the right gens. instead it's supposed to be funny for the audience that like oh look kajol doesn't look know how to like be like around like you know this like weird party yeah like the um scene where she's like apologizing to amita Bachchan for breaking like one of the vases in his house and it's like she's calling vase gumla yeah which is which translates to like a pot like yeah. where you keep like plants and i mean it's fine like she doesn't need to know the word like vase you know like and yeah it's supposed to be like this hilarious moment of like oh look how uneducated she is and essentially because she doesn't know that it's a vase like what's that all about yeah and i feel like like even though so much of the plot conflict is built around like this like issue of like class like it's sad how like we're supposed to laugh at kajol's character because of her of her inability to like you know assimilate yeah assimilate to the upper classes but we are never seen like how she struggles to like you know 
never seen her actual like active interactions with this issue like later on right she just kind of slots in right and we never yeah. see her like actually interact with the fact like oh like like class affects so much of her life but we never see her engaging with it like beyond like just this like issue that happens to her again this is like a still passive thing right or even or even like you know the analysis or examination of how like class dynamics could affect like her marriage mm-hmm. to Shah Rukh Khan like sure they went to London and Shah Rukh Khan started fresh but he was starting at like a more privileged position like even like the, that process of assimilating to a new country would have been entirely different from her for her because Shah Rukh Khan used to live in the UK apparently before he studied there mm-hmm. so it was a whole different thing for him but we never got to see any of those like yeah. nuances yeah and i feel of- like there's like a lot that is like that can be like extrapolated from the story but like it's just never presented like to us as an audience like we're never given we're never kajol's character is never developed to like show like how she faced these issues because again the story was never about her like you know even though she's the main yeah. character the story isn't about her it's about Shah Rukh Khan's journey and like Hrithik Roshan's yeah. journey and yeah and that just like makes this whole like all the representation that we get that isn't like just upper class Hindu like rich like you know like upper caste probably like Indians like all the representation that is supposed to exist to counter that like it ultimately falls short because they're either there just to serve as aesthetic comic relief or just just kind of like as a blob of a plot point who never gets to engage with it in any other way and i think that the worst part is like in terms of like the class dynamic and like that representation we see like them existing as passive people who don't have any say in like how they're affected and only have to be on the receiving end of how the upper class people like react to the situations and everything. So like Shah Rukh Khan and the right ones are the active perpetrators in the situation and like Kajol and Karina and like their whole family have to be sort of passive like participants in right. this whole thing. Yeah. And even like apart from like the socioeconomic disadvantage, I think even in like within the right and like household Ritik Roshan's character when he's a kid is like constantly like fat shamed within his own house by his own brother at that and like his parents are completely like turning a blind eye to it you know like they don't mind or they find they find it funny too and it's just like such a bad representation of you know bodily diversity or like even a plus size character just being there for the sake of fat shaming yeah no like absolutely and i think like in that that's why like i think one of our points for like our sauce meter is that oh like is there at least one diverse south asian identity without it being tokenization and i think for that question i think kabi kushi kabi gum like fails like badly like this just (laughs) does not have any representation that is substantial enough to not be just like just token essentially yeah yeah they're all there for just comic relief or tokenization yeah um yeah and like this brings us to like sort of like our second sort of question which is like do the women and the marginalized characters in this movie have any agency and i think we kind of talked over it like already to a degree but i think this is like a good point to like talk about jaya Bachchan's character um she like i mean she is like she has i think like a very prominent role like in terms of like plot points at least like for the movie Mm -hmm. because she's like you know she has this whole thing where she like absolutely does not speak up against anything amita bachan says and he's like doing his like oh bus like you know like that whole thing and and like she has absolutely no like she's completely silenced in her own home And then you kind of see it like sort of at the climax of the movie, she like talks back to him, right? And and the silence goes beyond that because she's not allowed to like pretty much have any say over anything that Amitabh Bachchan decides, whether it's like, oh, like, like, I I don't, I don't, I mean, we don't get to see it, but I don't know if she had any say over the adoption. And then she didn't get 
to have any say when like her husband just banished her son like that was just like and like, yeah. her favorite son at that right like he just banished her son her feedback was just like absolutely not even res- like n- he was not willing to hear anything she had to say and she just kind of had to like like miserably stay in this like castle for like 10 plus years and not be able to say anything about like this like a strange like son that she had no choice in like estranging right and i feel like her character could have been such a good like device to talk about like a like just like patriarchy and like also like just class and like i think there's just like so much to talk about through her character and like how absolutely and i think that yeah like even as a rich woman she's still silenced in her own home because patriarchy and class go like exist at the same time right the intersectionality of like that is like shown through her character and i think that i if we got to see her engage more with like just her reality like she didn't have to fight it like i get the realities of women in south asia she didn't have to fight it but if she was just aware of like oh this is how it's shitty for me i think that's the thing that's the really interesting thing about jaya bachan's character too that she's so present throughout the whole movie like even like when they're all in london when rithik roshan is also in london there's that po- portrait of her and amitabh bachan hanging in the in shahrukh khan's like new house and she's so present like in the movie but she's also like at the same time so invisible because we barely get to hear from her we barely get to see her in any sort of role that's not like being oppressed or silenced or just being like you know a mother to her kids and she's so limited in that i mean like i think for jabachan's character what is like even funnier is that you don't even get to see her in a very maternal like role even because daijan kind of like slots in over there right and you see jabachan yeah. the only reason she exists more as a wife than as a mother because that's how she's confined in that house and like you have this woman who is like an upper class woman still and like she like they talk about how she was picked to be like amita bachan's like wife and everything and she's not even given the opportunity to be maternal to her like own children like beyond just like sort of doing puja and everything but like she just like i mean yeah like we get to see like she's silenced and like sort of her hands are tied in so many ways like it's very like sad like i think it's a very good commentary on how sometimes patriarchy will like just exist in a very insidious way even in like upper class like structures absolutely and i think another great example of that in the movie is actually rani mukherjee's character who's also like at least pretty upper class or like similarly economically positioned to the raijans and she's her like sole purpose in the movie seems to be to be objectified and sexualized by Amitabh Bachchan by Shahrukh Khan and even like her own dad and she's just there to like fulfill these men's wishes essentially her dad wants her to marry Shahrukh Khan Amitabh Bachchan wants her to marry Shahrukh Khan and so she's conveniently also in love with Shahrukh Khan yeah you know? like there's not much to her character and I don't think she gets to show any agency at all like even like her being disappointed with the marriage is like take I mean you think if you're raised to be like married to someone and he just kind of fucks off in the middle you think you'd be a little more sad but like conveniently she's just like you go ahead and be she's happy she's so understanding yeah she's she's not even mad she's not even like pissed And I think that just shows like how little agency is given to like Rani Mukherjee's like character. When it comes to autonomy and agency, I think we'll all like think about Kajol's character because I mean we were talking about it, like how she's like out she's outspoken, she's loud and opinionated, but like not in like a bad way, but like you know what I mean. But like Kajol's character is shown to have like a lot more agency and autonomy, right? Like you'd think on the surface. But then Kajol yeah. like I mean at the beginning if you like all like think about it like Kajol's character was very like put off by like Shahrukh Khan being like 
having like just constantly making advances right and this keeps perpetuating like the negative idea that like oh no means yes you just haven't like tried hard enough like and this is like a problem with all bollywood movies yeah and it's like a pretty much like a repetition of ddlj yeah it? and like whether no it's way. ddlj or anything like there's just this idea that like oh if a woman is like you know not responsive or put off by you you just have to try even harder and like more like you know like you just have to convince her yeah you just have to convince her and it's just like very like it 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 leaves a bad taste and like i think like you know this is supposed to be the great romance of the movie but shark khan was going to break up with her after he talked to his dad and when he walked into jadni jog like she was like her dad had died and that's the only reason that he like marries her but it also like just goes to show like just like like kajo like didn't really get to exhibit much choice over there like she was just in a really shitty situation at that time and she just kind of had to be like okay all right i'll marry you because like you know raising a child in like india as a single woman is just absolutely like dramatic to think about yeah and it's the, the that scene actually had like that really interesting symbology where shahrukh khan like gets into chandni chowk and then he just goes and puts his head like hand on her head and it's like okay now i own you like you belong to me yeah. and like, i'll take care of you now and it's just that also like you know like and it's like yeah even if like she got to con- like i don't know how much she got to consent to it but it kind of feels like she just kind of fell into that marriage right like she didn't like, yeah. she, circumstantially she fell into that marriage and it also like makes me think about like oh like kajo like absolutely hated being in the uk how much did she even get a say about like moving to the uk when shahrukh khan was banished from like the greater delhi area right like her entire family like or like the rest of her family and her friends and her community is back in like chandni chowk why did she just have to like up and leave like did she get a say in this right and like ultimately like even though kajol is on the surface level has more like you know like autonomy to speak and what not compared to like the other women in the movie like she doesn't really get to exercise much agency over her like life right because she doesn't get to choose when she gets married she doesn't get to choose like where she lives afterwards like it's it just seems like she's kind of like at the hands of the man th- that she's with whether it's like her like bear with whether it's like her dad or her husband like you know that's just been her life yeah and even in the end of the movie when like they're all back for dadi's funeral and stuff and like kajol is the one who's trying to convince shahrukh khan to like come back to india he's being like super stubborn and like obstinate about it like oh yeah no i can't stop fighting with my dad cuz he was like horrible which you know like valid <laughs> like yeah <laughs> yeah i mean sure but also I mean, why aren't your wife's like wishes slightly more important? Yeah. You know, like I mean, India is a big country. Like you can live in <laughs> India, not meet your dad. Yeah. And I mean, on on the other hand, like Poo is like or Pooja or Karina Kapoor's character is shown to be like so risque and like so out there, you know. And even she seems to have like very limited agency. Like sure, in the when she. is like introduced in her new like avatar it's like oh my god who so hot so sexy and she's just who she is and then as soon as like the whole ritik roshan scene happens or like that angle starts like developing who's like completely like t- did a 180 to like you know being super sanskari and super like obedient and I'm going to get married and like just be a good wife now. And it 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 was so out of character for her because of how she was presented. I mean like yeah, like her whole shtick was like, you know, like after she met Rithik Roshan suddenly she's like, I mean she's like, oh, I'm still going to dress hot, but I'm going to have like a sanskari like um little like <laughs> dupatta on my neck. Like that's my like whole thing. Like it's fine. It's like a compromise, right? Like you're supposed to think like Pooja's coming to a compromise because she's not going like full sanskari like wife and what not, but like she's going like a, a midway because she's modern like you know and all that. Uh but like her character doesn't really get a whole lot beyond like introduce 
sing Riti Groshan back to like the yeah. Shah Rukh Khan family. Like that, I feel like is the and her just being like conveniently similar age to Riti Groshan to like marry him at the end. Like that's like the whole point. It seems, yeah, yeah, and like I feel like. It's just such a big contrast to how she's introduced because her whole introduction and like just how she interacts with Shah Rukh Khan at the very beginning is like you know like she has control over how she wants to be perceived like right like whether it's like like kitsch or whatever like the whole thing is that like she gets to choose how she wants to be perceived by the world and then like it just kind of feels like her whole point in the movie is that like oh like here's a character we can all slut shame until she like transitions yeah. into sanskari life you know um and yeah and this like also like like if we were talking about all the women i really want to talk about like farida jalal's character because her character is just reduced to this like forever caregiver role right and like she pretty much has no agency over her own life and seems to be entirely like like has given her 100 Mm percent to this like one family and i don't know why she's in london like i think it's like implied that jaya bachan is like asked her to go she had to abandon her like own kid to like go take care of like Shah Rukh Khan like what the actual fuck yeah yeah and like her kid was like starting up a family and had she must have had grandchildren and whatnot and like she just like is not there and it's like oh like what is her life and like also like in these movies, like, do visas just, like, not exist? Like, what visa is, like, Farida Jalal's character on? And, like, how did Shah Rukh Khan just, like, show up there? Like, and, like, I get that like, he had, like, an Oxford MBA and, like, he could have landed some, like, like cushy job up there. But, like, it just seems like, oh, he's starting from scratch and he, like, suddenly has, like, a ma- McMansion in, like, like London. Yeah, his house in London, yeah, house in like, London okay, is all right. huge, too. That's convenient. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, visas clearly were, <laughs> yeah. like, an issue in the early 2000s is what i'm gonna gather from this yeah and like the thing is that farida jalal's character is so like affected by like both classist and patriarchal like sort of like experience because she's a single mother like that's the that's also like an implication in the movie like we don't get to see her like spouse but like the general assumption is that she was a single mother and that's why she was like you know wanted to get make sure her daughter got married well and everything because even at the uh, scene where like the families come to see yeah. like rooks are like she's the only one there right so like why would you leave your only daughter behind and like it's clearly you don't have to like support her the same way like, but his daughters as, like, belong so, to like, their husband's family after getting married oh my god oh but yeah god. i mean no yeah no, it just feels bad because I, I feel really bad for her character because she gave like literally like everything to this family and her say is absolutely not respected by like anyone in this family like Shah Rukh Khan begrudgingly goes to like her daughter's wedding even though she literally raised him and his brother and he only goes to like her daughter's wedding to like romance like Kajol Jaya Bachchan wants to go to Raksar's wedding but Amitam Bachchan is like too much of a classist like whatever to like even show up he's just like no we can't go there how can we go there yeah and it's just like like she literally f- raised your kids maybe be a little Seriously. more just like respectful about this like yeah and like and i think that like that brings us to a close on like the agency thing because like i don't think any of the women in this movie got to like exhibit any like agency like in actuality over their lives like on the surface level like from south asian standards like they were like really pushing the envelope like with puja or like even kajol being like loud and whatnot at the first half of the movie or like even having the ability to complain and whatnot and it's like yeah like on the surface that's great but how much control did any of them have over their own pretty lives? much none right yeah. this brings us to like our like next question which is like Oh, like, did these people, like, the women and the marginalized characters, were they at least, like, if they did not have agency, were they at least aware of the power dynamics of society and how it, like, affected them? Because I think, like, it's not wrong for, like, a movie to show, like, someone who's just, like, entirely stifled by, like, their, like, reality and whatnot. But I think it's important for movies to show it, A, as a bad thing, Mm -hmm. and B, like, as, like, the or at least giving the characters enough agency to recognize that what's happening to them 
is a bad thing or if not them someone in vicinity of them to recognize that it's like a bad thing yeah like, i think um, they were because they grew up in probably like or that's how it was shown at least that they grew up in an area where everyone around them was of a similar like socioeconomic position the the only way they could contextualize their identity was through their agents and like the fact that there was this vast difference between their like power and privilege you know yeah and like i feel like the only point that where we see like them actively interacting with like the idea of like class is like where um puja like the younger puja goes to like um um younger ritik russian school and over there he him and his like rich like snobby little like little kid friends like all like bully her and they're like oh how tacky your hair smells like oil yeah oily and you can't like you can't like sp- speak in english and you're yeah. oily and yeah 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 and like these kids like like who the f- like you know, they're all none of their parents are raising them if like amitha <laughs> bachan's household's any example like they're clearly like raised like little shits and like if their dad is like amitha bachan i'm not surprised that's how they like act with people but that is like the one scene <laughs> that we see where like it's like yeah like classism is actively shitty and i think like using children as a lens to like sort of cuz children don't have filters right children are like absolutely horrible little demons and like when classism comes out of like children it feels like like oh shit it's there right because when amita bachan does it it's like oh yeah but traditions like blah blah burn, blah burn. but when when children do it it's like you know it's actually terrifying and I think that's one of the only points where we see them sort of actively engage or react to like class dynamics because Pooja like ends up crying about it and feeling like really bad about it or like completely valid like for her to feel like absolutely like shit about it and then I think Shahrukh Khan's character because he still wants to bone Kajol like ends up taking his brother to go apologize to this girl which is the only scene where we see them address like classes behavior and like but actually apologize for really. it really like they apologize sure but it's also like i remember that scene because shahrukh khan is like oh never hurt a pretty girl's heart like that's like you know it's like done and dusted it's like shoved under the carpet that's like, true that's true i i mean i yeah like i think it's like it's not about it they still find a way to not make it about class and make it a way to like oh you just hurt her feelings when the root of it was like oh you're a little shit who was like really classist and like just why are you this way but like yeah and i think that while it's a more active scene than even the i mean it's more active than the entire movie was was what i was trying to go for like the entire movie has this entire yeah. even worse sort of bullying and like there's no conclusion to that other than oh yeah we're all just going to be family now like it's cool like um but like that scene i think was like the one scene where it was act like where like we got to see puja like react to it be- and like recognize that it was because of like class that she was being treated badly right yeah. and and i think kajol never has that realization when the right ones like treat her like shit like she never feels like she's she's never shown to actively interact with or like recognize like oh like that yeah the right ones are being shitty to me because of who i am they're like they are f- horrible people we only get to see her as like oh this marriage was invalid because it like you know the parents weren't there yeah she blah, blah, like blah. makes excuses for them essentially saying oh yeah they're old it's okay we still need their blessings and their love and whatever like she never really actively addresses the fact that oh hey shahrukh khan like your parents were like super shitty to me like and i think she like constantly internalizes it as being like it was just like realistic like you know like that's what people end up doing but like i think as the movie there was like at least the we could have at least seen her be sad about how what happened to her was bad yeah and someone even, even like, shahrukh khan, yeah, like, shahrukh khan even... never like addresses the fact that his parents were like super shitty to her the whole thing is about his heartbreak and his yeah. feeling like rejected by his dad and him never addressing the fact that like 
what happened to his like wife the woman he chose to marry was just like absolutely classist and just not acceptable at all yeah. like he did not like when you're choosing to marry someone you need to f- stand up for them and if you are like just like oh yeah i'm so bummed out because my dad isn't accepting this without any consideration for the fact that what this might make this like woman feel like then at that point you're just like just as self-centered as your like shitty dad <laughs> like basically you know? yeah and i mean even for farida jalal i think for her character we never explicit explicitly see class awareness but we do see like class resignation you know in a sense because she's just completely resigned herself to the fact that this is the family that she's going to be working for forever even and even though she's raising these kids and she treats them like her own kids like Shah Rukh Khan and Ritik Roshan she's never treated like family by the regions except for maybe like Ritik Roshan when he was younger because she was his only like protector they all kind of like you know push her into the background or like not see her essentially she's like also the only person that Kajol essentially has in London too right and it's really sad that like her character is just just like essentially never viewed as like fat tier one family when like she was in London for 10 years Jaya Bachchan wasn't right <laughs> like and it's just shitty her character like faced like just like this was like a good opportunity to talk about the intersections of like like classism and patriarchy and and like her recognition of the fact that oh while she still comes from like in you know like established whatever like economically advantaged family like she still has no say and we could have seen her like trying to reconcile with these like just sort of elements of her like life and we just don't get to see her do anything other than have like a big moment at the end yeah and we don't see like the impact of that either beyond like yeah. amitabh bachchan like giving her a hug he never even says the word like sorry to her for yeah. like you know yeah and it kind of just feels like a pressurized like lid sort of blowing off rather than someone who's like reflected on like just their like yeah like, just sort of oppression over like the last like you know like 10 15 30 years you know however long it's been like it just feels like oh like look she just kind of lost it at that point after yeah. we did like shit for so long but it's never you know done in a way where it's a reflection of like how specific her oppression was and how layered yeah, yeah. i mean i think that in a way like we it is it is kind of like it's not great representation when it comes to like awareness of power dynamics there's shown to have some inkling of awareness over it yeah i think that takes us to like our last couple of questions um the fourth one being do women and marginalized characters have meaningful relationships with each other and this is this was like a slightly confusing one because we see all of these women in the movie but we never really see you know fleshed out relationships between them um like the most notable one being Karina Kapoor and Kajol like who are sisters um they have the closest relationship out of any of the women in the movie and yet we only see kajol in a very like semi parental role but they never have much to say to each other they never they never even talk about their dad or their loss beyond like that one puja thing that they do when rithik roshan is there and they're like oh yeah we went to the mandir because it was dad's birthday and i mean they don't even really talk about that yeah no like i think that like kajol and karina kapoor's relationship is like the most active female relationship that we see and even then it's just very like i mean we don't see much beyond like i mean it's the like oh kajol feels a responsibility towards her because you know like she's the only parent like guardian figure to like you know karina kapoor's character and kajol like i think like doesn't like slut shame karina kapoor like as much as like shark khan does i think like that's also like i think i guess like something substantial there um and then we see farida jalal's character and kajol sort of finding like solace in each other because they've both been dragged to like london from <laughs> yeah. tajik jock and so i guess that's like something but again like none of these female relationships get like 
much screen time. I think the only substantially friendship that we can like actually refer to is like Daddy and Nani being like friends and like- and even they're pretty much relegated to just being there for like the occasional comedy or like you know giving family vibes or something or like for yeah. Daddy just like dying. <laughs> yeah, and I think like like I just think about how isolated Jaya Bachchan's character was. Like, I mean, she pretty much was around for Ida Jalal all this time, but she didn't have like much of a relationship with her beyond feeling like responsibility and like just bare minimum politeness. Yeah, <laughs> like, and I mean, like, for Ida Jalal really respected Jaya Bachchan's character. Like, it was pretty obvious. But because of that power dynamic, you never see like a friendship. You know, like I think the yeah. the most vulnerability in their relationship is actually when Jaya Bachchan's like oh yeah please go take care of my kid in London and that's it yeah. but like I mean it's a very employer employee relationship yeah. yeah and so yeah like we have these female relationships that are present but they never really like exist for their like they never really exist beyond like just like practicality and it just never feels like it's their like like we don't ever see them have relationships that are like nuanced. substantial, yeah, yeah, or sub- nuanced or substantial. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you compare it to like, say, Amitabh Bachchan and Shah Rukh Khan's relationship, even though it becomes strained and tenuous in the second half of the movie, you get so much context into that relationship. Like, you get so much, you know, texture into that relationship. The fact that Shah Rukh Khan is adopted, leading to him wanting to overcompensate and like pleasing Mm. his dad and like all of those complexes that he has stemming from their relationship we get to see that but with all of the female relationships we just see a very like superficial yeah side it's very like one-dimensional too right and it's just like like i think like whether it's like kajol and her friendship with ruksar which like i think is only limited to like um like cricket and then like oh attending Rooksar's wedding and then just being neighbors and everything yeah or like Kajal's relationship with Karina Kapoor where like yeah like there's that texture of like her having feeling that sense of responsibility towards Karina Kapoor but it and like but it never we never get to see much of it right we just get to see her like yeah and we just get to see her passively like be around each other like it's never an active relationship at least like not i mean i guess like there's something but it's not substantial enough for it to like be like feel like enough yeah Yeah. i think that brings us to like our last question like oh like does did this movie challenge any flawed notions in society and i think like it's commendable that like for a movie in like the early 2000s to be like highlighting like like class discrimination which like i think like a lot of movies do to be entirely honest i don't think it was like revolutionary or anything but like to give it like credit where like you know where there's bare minimum credit but like the thing is that like it did highlight how like classism is like can tear apart families because it's bad and blah 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 and like i mean i don't know how good of a job it did in like highlighting that it's bad but it did show classism in like a very active way and it was the primary plot conflict but at the same time i think that it did absolutely nothing to like actually address the problem like it's like oh here is a problem we're just gonna ignore it and move on at the end and we're just gonna all become happy family and everything but we're never gonna address the underlying root like problems with what was the like the main plot conflict right yeah like, amitabh Bachchan was super problematic and classist and like Kajol should have there should have been more like and it just ultimately didn't end up addressing anything and kind of like stamped over it but happily ever after on top of it yeah and that was it like the conflict transformed from Amitabh Bachchan is a classist who doesn't want his kid to marry like someone poor to oh Amitabh Bachchan has forgiven his kid and now all is okay like you know it became ultimately it became about Amitabh Bachchan forgiving like Shah Rukh Khan than actually about him being super classist about like Kajol. And it just essentially keeps perpetuating those really problematic like class dynamics by portraying people of, you know, socioeconomic disprivilege as just there for like comic relief versus being like substantial characters with their own sort of journeys. Or like having the agency to demand 
for more like at the end you know like, I yeah feel like there's so call much, out like, like bad behavior yeah. yeah i think like all the apologizing that amita bachchan and shahrukh khan did to each other there wasn't enough apology towards kajol who i think was like like one of the main victims of this like entire like story and like overall like i think like bollywood has always had a classism problem of and course. whatnot but but like this movie i think ends up just being like oh like classism wasn't the problem it was just you know communication <laughs> like and it's like that was not the problem yeah it's like, essentially trying to say oh yeah rich people aren't actually classes they're just you know they're just i don't know what they are but they're not classes yeah <laughs> yeah they're not classes they just need to like you know like talk to their kids better <laughs> like they just need to be less like traditionally strict you know like they need to like like pipe down on the parampara a little bit mm. like that's it um but yeah no like i think that looking back at this movie after like this long it was very like i mean I don't think what we like I mean obviously we're not doing like a like a absolutely like you know like like theoretical deconstruction of the movie here but I think growing up and like looking back at like how we've all watched these sort of movies and just sort of kind of accepted this as sort of a part of our reality which like again it is like you know like it just feels kind of like bad how little we like ever question like just the upper class rich people in these like narratives right or even like recognizing classism as just a negative thing i think it's so ingrained in like how we interact with people and just interact with society in general that we never really even in our own selves we never acknowledge that it's bad to mistreat people because of their for both of us especially coming from relatively privileged backgrounds i think it's important to like acknowledge that and realize like how much that affected like how we watched these movies growing up right because like we just kind of this was our reality like to it i'm not like you know london mac mansion house <laughs> helicopter reality but like to whatever degree we were still privileged in like the south asian social hierarchy and we just kind of you know like this was very easy this, these are the in this this felt invisible like oh like because you were just so used to like sort of burying this like really glaring flaw in society yeah it's uncomfortable to like accept it and acknowledge it but i think yeah what you said as we grow older i think recognizing this in our media and beyond that like around ourselves in our like real life interactions is so important Yeah, and I think that growing like now that we're older and we have like we are learn learning constantly to do better and unlearning constantly to do better. Like I think it's important to look back at the, these movies and these everything that we like that shaped our childhood and like really critically examine how much they like how much we ignored in it and how much they continue to perpetuate like these horrible things in society. Yeah, and so like our rating and you can read more about it on our blog, but on sarisonscreen.com, our rating for this movie is 0.5 out of 5 because like ultimately when it comes to representation, it was mostly tokenization and so that's a 0. When it comes to women and marginalized characters having agency, it is a minus 1 because pretty much everyone just got shafted on that front. <laughs> and when it comes to awareness of the power dynamics in society we were generous and we gave it a one because we were like you know yeah there were there was at least a movie was cognizant of the fact that there are power dynamics in society and there were certain scenes which like i think the characters had to come like face to face with the fact like that their position in society is like affecting them right so that was like a generous very generous one because ultimately they didn't really interact with it actively or anything and in terms of having the women or the marginalized characters having good relationships with each other we gave it a zero because while they exist they're pretty much unsubstantial and lastly when we were looking at whether it challenged any like flawed notions in society we decided to be also generous and give it a 0.5 so overall bringing our score down to a 0.5 out of 5 which i mean It, I mean we weren't expecting this movie to get like like be a feminist masterpiece. Yeah, and I mean these are very specific parameters that we're measuring these on and of course like 
movies don't need to like pass our sauce meter to be good and i mean this is a good movie despite like having these yeah, I mean, problems. it's entertaining like yeah it's yeah an it's entertaining a fun movie. movie despite these problems but i think like recognizing these issues within it is just like part of i think a process to become more critically aware viewers and like consumers yeah. of media yeah and to critically engage with movies that sort of shaped us like very fundamentally right yeah and beyond I think the that, nostalgia of them you know. yeah i mean there's lots of there's lots of art films and indie movies that will address class better but and have ex- have addressed class better in previous times but these are the more accessible movies that i mean that you've watched i've watched people in people richer than us have watched and people like you know less well off than us have watched like these are the more accessible movies and that's why it's so important for accessible media to do better and while you know this is still like you know like a general like conversation about the movie i think this gives us and our listeners a general framework to like critically examine these movies that we've all watched and everyone can watch right and really assess whether they've done a good job and what can be done to make these media like better better yeah absolutely with that we're here to the ending of our episode and we just wanted to thank you all for tuning into this episode of Sorry's on screen make sure to subscribe and drop us some feedback on our socials and also drop us recommendations for any movie that you would like for us to tackle in our next deep dive um, we'll be back in two weeks with our next episode talking about sex and sexuality in south asian cinema and we're available anywhere that podcasts are platformed Bye.